This year, we want the best, or nothing at all. We don't want tradition, we want to live in the present, and the only history that's worth a tinker's damn is the history we make today. You all know our first customer was a lunatic, and the second had a death wish, but they bought our breakless bangers, and there were a few accidents. But the only mistake is the one from which we learn nothing. This year, customers demand safety, and of course, active safety features include rapid acceleration for safe overtaking. I know it will be hard to add the new motor block section to the factory, but before you say you cannot do something, try it! To every engineer, every planner, every mechanic, and every salesperson in this great company, I say, if I can dream it, you can do it! This mission statement at the start of Splotter's latest economic lumbering beast of a game, Horseless Carriage, sold me on its premise in a way that only the creators of Shut Up and Sit Down favourite food chain Magnate can. You have to understand, this game arrived on a wave of hype for me. Dutch publisher Splotter are famous for making games that are so ruthless and cruel they encourage a level of player creativity that isn't really seen anywhere else in board games. They're hulking capitalist machines that are as much problems to be solved as games to be played. They provide a hot new itch that only they can scratch. So I was excited for Horseless Carriage without really knowing what the game was, other than that it was about designing the very first cars. What possibilities! What excitement! To have a brand new splotter game that I know nothing about? And when it arrived, I poured over the rulebook and neatly bagged up all the components and then just as quickly unbagged them for our first game and then our second, then our third, and then our fourth. And what a spread. A full glutinous table of ideas for us to feast upon. What is this game? Where does it fit in the Splotter canon? And is it going to be fun? In Horseless Carriage, you are one of several historical car boys and girls who want to make quick bucks selling fresh whips. Over the course of the game, you're trying to make as much money as possible, and you do this by excelling at what I will describe as the two hemispheres of horseless carriage. Horseless and, ca no, uh, cars and money. Let's talk about that first half first. Each round, you're gonna be using your own personal factory board to assemble cars. Cars that you'll birth from these mainline tiles socketed into your factory board. In order to sell that baby, a mainline needs to be next to a dealership, the storefront of your factory. Now these main lines are currently set up to produce bland, featureless motors. You want to get an edge on the competition here if you're going to get the big bucks up on the market. But don't, no wait, don't look at that yet. <clears throat> uh, you want to get an edge on the competition, right? So maybe you make these cars a bit more exciting. Each round you'll get the chance to research technologies, one space for every research department you've stuck in your factory beforehand. The technologies are spread across different categories. Range, reliability, speed, safety, and design, each showing a series of car parts that you can find down here. And once you've researched a tech, you can socket that component right into your factory floor because, you know, maybe you want your car to have, I don't know, an engine? Simply plop that station down into your factory and connect it up to the main line with a little arrow showing that the engine is making cars on that main line go faster because you've not quite worked out how to make it more reliable or actually go far yet. Whenever you improve what your cars can do, you're going to put a little cube of that colour on the dealership to show that that dealership is now selling cars that are, say, tier 1 speed and tier 2 reliable on account of the components connected up to it. But you see this hatching? This means that you need to connect this kind of part to the corresponding part of the mainline. And remember, that mainline still needs to connect to a dealership and everything needs to connect back to this loading bay in the corner. Oh, and maybe you want your car to have some design too so people buy it because of its looks. That means you need to find space for this paint can to go. And hey, maybe you actually might want these features to go into your latest range of sports cars so you'll pop a mainline down for those too. <laughs> yeah, nice. Oh, and maybe some marketing for your dealership so you can sell to more of the market. Wait, no, I told you not to look at that yet. You'll immediately notice that there is just too much going on here. Even a very simple car is going to take up a lot of space, space that you are incredibly limited in. You can't create a fully functioning, excellent motor with this very small factory you start with. And so the game forces you to specialize straight out the gate. Choose the niche in which you're going to get the edge on your opponents in. 
And one of the things that's most immediately striking about Horseless Carriage is that all of this planning, all of this building, all of this organization, it's all done mostly simultaneously, mostly free form with players just taking the parts they want and slapping them down with no real restrictions on what you can build, just where you can build it. Each round is punctuated with these long stretches of silence where players hunker down and tinker with what's on their personal boards. It's quite lovely, it's quite experimental and quite freeing until you realise you have to glue everything down now and forever. And this, in reality, makes it so that every round of the game is a fresh new hell as you stare down at the spaghetti mess of a factory you've built, swearing bloody murder at your past self for designing such a deeply dysfunctional wreck. And it's delightful. So that's the first half of the game, these phases here. You're going to be researching technology that you're going to plug into a freeform factory of your making to create cars, which you're then going to sell in the second phase. So let's talk about the market board. This is the market board, and each car represents a prospective buyer who might take a visit to your dealership and grab one of these newfangled horseless carriages. These buyers are contained inside of niches, these squares, and each niche is part of a price bracket shown by this diagonal hatching and label, with prices getting higher the further diagonally up you go. In practice, the way that the market board works is it shows players what buyers expect from their cars each year, what new features they might want, and more crucially, what buyers are willing to pay for those new features. For example, this buyer wants to have a car that's at least tier 2 in safety and tier 2 in reliability, because those are the techs that we care about this round, shown by them being right next to the board here and here. And for this esteemed motor, these buyers will cough up $4, but if you could make your car just a little bit safer, you could access these customers here, who'll pay $6 each, but can you make it work in your factory? Complicating this even more is the very unconventional but very clever way you represent your stake in this market. Each round, players get given these weird plastic windows to physically capture areas of the market that they are interested in selling to each round. But other players can overlap and pinch customers right out from under your nose. And what's more, if you have better marketing, these windows get bigger and bigger and bigger to soak up more and more cash. But because you can only ever sell to one niche at a time, it's going to be a real fight for space and for turn order. Goodness me, what a long teach, and I haven't even explained all of the rules here. There are eight phases in this game, each nuanced and complicated in their own little ways. Eight entire phases with winding, twisting tech and grit to go through that, frankly, you'll probably be bored by me explaining. But hopefully you can see the cut and thrust of this box. Design cars in your factory, contending with the harsh realities of a gritty tech tree and the amount of space you actually have to work with, and then sell those cars in this market, which is ever-shifting based on the whims of other players. And before we get into more grit here, Splotter has made another very funny game. Every Splotter game has incredibly dry but a systematic wit to it. Bus has its ridiculous time travel mechanic that has people thinking they're going to the pub after work, but really getting shipped straight back in for another full day. Roads and Boats features endless comedy stemming from its reality of nobody really owning anything, right? Technically, the concept of ownership isn't real. <laughs> and Fuche Magnate's apocalyptic approach to supply and demand models a reality that's so grim it is farcical. So this publisher somehow manages to make the driest, most spreadsheet-looking games on the market sing at producing comedy, and this time it's mostly comedy in failure. Every turn of this game is spent with your head in various stages of being in your hands as you are aghast at the horrible factory that you've produced and you picture the hideous cars coming off of its mainline. Look ma, I've made a car that's just a painted chassis. This one's real fast. Look at all those red arrows. Brakes? Psh. But it's that balance on the giddy edge of total comedic failure that makes your victories in this game feel so sweet. It feels like you've earned it by besting your opponents with savage manipulations of the market. 
It's this absolutely frightening combination of really lean and svelte tile laying puzzle with a messy player driven economy that absolutely sings when everything is humming along nicely where this has to adapt to that and vice versa. A friend of mine playing this game simply asked, why can't you just cram five research departments straight into your factory? And the answer is, you can. You can do that on round one. That's how much freedom you're afforded to build what you want. But he then proceeded to do exactly this and then screamed for every single round of the game because he'd filled his factory with boffins with no room to actually build any cars. Ding, ding, ding! That's Splotter! That's it right there! That's what excites me most, maybe, about this game. It's seeing people's personal playstyles evolve on these boards in real time. You know those pictures where they show spiders getting honked up on the hard stuff and the webs go all loopy when they have coffee? That's this game! You can pinpoint the exact moment that your friend pivoted their whole factory towards paint when they realized that design is all anyone cares about this round. You know, fun trivia, I quit caffeine like five days ago on account of it spiking my anxiety. And you know, it's great. I feel invincible. The only problem is that I have to trick my body into thinking it's getting its caffeine hit by drinking multiple full pots of decaf a day. You know, it's actually pretty easy for me because this guy up here, he's easily fooled. The point here is that Horseless Carriage still features that excellent trademark mix of planning versus pivoting. I didn't really know in one game why I was leaving so much empty space in my factory until one round where suddenly the market shifted into an entirely different field that no one had really prepared for. Except for me, I had a bunch of empty space and I could turn my whole factory into doing something completely different so that I could pinch customers from under people's noses. It's a classic splotter economic puzzle, but laid on top of a ruthless and hellish and quite satisfying spatial puzzle. So what's not to love here? Well... Okay, so sorry to bury the lead here, but Horse's Carriage is not all roses. It's not all peachy, and it's probably better if I showed you why. I know what you're thinking, this can't be that bad. But to me, personally, it really is. The amount of upkeep, fiddliness, and admin that's in this game slows it down so much. There are so many bits and bobs on this table that need to be restocked, manipulated, or avoided that if you are the one hosting the game, you're gonna be perpetually terrified by even an errant sleeve hovering over the table. And now you might be thinking, hey, Tom, this seems a little unfair. Aren't all of the Splotter games this fiddly and annoying? Yes, they totally are, but not this bad, I checked. I played Roads and Boats, Food Chain Magnate and Bus, and the only one that comes close is Roads and Boats because that game is literally demented. Is playing something, is this like Settlers of Catan? And we're like, yeah, yeah. but in hell. <laughs> um, but I do think this game has it worse because there's a level of fiddliness to the basic motions that bogs things down quite a lot. Like that simultaneous building phase where you just take whatever parts you need. That sounds great. It sounds simple. It sounds quick, right? But you can look at other players' boards and try and work out what they're doing, which does slow the game down considerably when they're not quite done yet. And maybe you want to change what you're doing based on what they're doing, so really it's not that simultaneous at all. And on top of that, these components are always limited, and they go to the person furthest up the engineering track in a tie. So there are points in this game where you grab bits only to have someone else later decide that they'd quite like them, actually. It slows the game down beyond enjoyable process and into boggy boredom when someone has their plans shot down with someone else's slight change of heart. And when you expand your factory, you expand at the end of your factory placement phase, meaning you have to plan excruciatingly far ahead in a way that burns your brain and also slows the pace down even more. But here's maybe the biggest departure from other splotters. It's that so much of the game happens down here rather than over here. 
A hallmark of previous Splatter titles is that there's this centralized section of the board, the space where everyone peers at, where the action happens. Food Chain Magnate, The Great Zimbabwe, Bus, Roads and Boats, all these games have this real concern with shared space, with shared infrastructure. The shared space in this game is this market board over here, and it only gets access towards the back half of the round in a way that affects how you play, but never manages to feel as alive or sparky as the shared geography in other Splatter titles. Really, whether this game is for you or not is how much you enjoy this puzzle right here. And you know what's more? You can torpedo your game state in this game in more brazen ways than ever before. This game can be deeply unsatisfying if played wrong, and you won't know what wrong is until you've done it. And that's really actually quite great. Listen, I can complain all day about various aspects of Horseless Carriage being fiddly and Byzantine and complex, but to lots of people, those are selling points. Hell, to me, those are selling points to an extent. I don't quite love this game as much as other games in the Splotter canon, but you'll probably know by now if this is the thing for you, if the fiddle to faff ratio is worth it. For me, I think the fiddle is absolutely worth it because I love this spatial puzzle. It's ruthless and rewards careful planning as much as it does absolutely tanking those plans to make a quick buck because everyone wants fast cars this year. But the rest of my group didn't enjoy this puzzle. They felt like it demanded too much of them too quickly, and ultimately that the end results of the puzzle didn't really satisfy. I think they'd rather something more directly interactive too, especially from this publisher. To them, the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze, and not for want of trying. We played this game several times, and they were determined to really get along with it, but there came a point in one of our most recent games where I sort of realized I was pushing my friends through this puzzle again, a puzzle that they weren't necessarily having a great time with that was wearing on their patience a little bit. Which is to say, like, these games aren't for everyone. Duh, who knew? But this game, more than the others. This is a niche within a niche, if you will. A niche that you can sell to for $4 a round. But ultimately, I adore what this represents in the space. It is just such a breath of fresh air. It might not be perfect, but I continue to be fascinated and interested and am compelled by the designs that Splotter make. I really am glad that they're out there making these incredibly strange, unique boxes. I was lucky enough to get sent a review copy of this game, but if I hadn't been sent that, I would have bought one. And would I have been disappointed with my purchase? Maybe a smidge, especially considering the cost, and especially considering that I adore the other games so much that it's just an impossibly high bar to reach. But would I have had a great time? Yes, absolutely. Would I continue to enjoy this incredibly strange box? Yeah, I would. And would I have felt great that I supported one of the strangest, smallest, weirdest publishers out there in board games right now? Yeah, I would. And I cannot wait for what comes next. And I would still jump at the chance to play Horseless Carriage with anyone, especially people who are really into it. So, buy this game if you think you want one of the most brain-burning planning puzzles on the market that's got a good chunk more interaction than what you'd find in most other tile-laying games. But what if you like the ideas of this game, but are maybe put off by some of the criticisms in this video? Well, first up, I would always recommend other Splotter titles. Food Chain Magnate continues to be absolutely incredible, I love my plays of it, and whilst complicated, it is easier to grasp and far more interactive. Bus, the capstone re-release, is really something, albeit a little less strongly splutter. And Roads and Boats is so far off the deep end on every axis, but is also deeply out of print. But further afield, a really strong alternative recommendation for me would be Pipeline. A brutal, reactive, capitalist puzzle that's less faff and maybe more fun because of it. It all depends on your tolerance for that faff and your burning desire for bumpers free gameplay. But Pipeline has the puzzle and it has the economy with far fewer components. Very strong recommendation for this game, always. And that's the end 
of this here video on Splodder's Horseless Carriage. If you enjoyed this video, please consider backing us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to our monthly newsletter, where we talk about all the cool games, all the cool films, all the cool TV, all the cool music we've been indulging ourselves in recently, and you get a sort of from the heart, passionate little chat about something that we care about recently. I did a big newsletter about Frosthaven and how hard it is to make a review. You can check that out over on the Patreon for as little as five bucks a month to support your favorite board game channel out there. We're the, we're the best. But what else have we got going on that you might care about? Well, we've started Twitch streaming again, and you can check us out on twitch.tv slash shut up and sit down, where you can see me mostly goofing off, doing nonsense. Here are some clips from some streams to tempt you in. Didn't stick with me that game. <laughs> if this doesn't make you feel something, I don't know what will. Just get him. Just get him. <laughs> and that's it. That's the end of the video. You can go home now, and I need to pack up this game. Um, that's why I chose this big wide shot, to show you how much game there is to pack up and how long it's probably going to take me. I hope you liked it. I, I, I think it's a fun angle. Okay, bye.